Check, check. I opened up this chapter, and I read it, and I read it, and I read it, and I thought, help me, God. Help me see in Exodus 38 what, what you want to say. And I'm just going to read it without saying much first uh, and let you hear it and then show you a tiny little video. It's not, it's not this lengthy thing. It's like a couple minutes that will help you picture what I'm talking about. Because we're going to be on the tabernacle construction for a little while. And that would be like, ugh. Like a lot of people avoid that section like you would um, uh, Chronicles and the Begats and, you know, the the histories and those things are rough. When you're doing the uh, read through the Bible in a year, that's the section that you're like, man, I'd kind of like to get through this. Uh, And there's a reason for that. That section of Scripture is, is... very referential, like, like, like looking up something in a thesaurus or a dictionary, who, who begat who, and, and following the lineage through. Fascinating. And I have found such fantastic jewels in God's Word everywhere, including the lineage uh, of Christ, the lineage of, of the Israelites. Uh, there's just all kinds of gems there. And you wouldn't think they'd be here. I'm going to read it to you just like it is first. I, 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 I thought... How in the world am I going to string enough information together to last a half an hour <laughs> or, or out of this chapter? I can't even get past the first section now because of what God's spoken to me. So we're really just going to spend our time at the altar of burnt offering. Uh, underneath of it, it'll start to talk about the, um, the laver, the, you know, the, where you're going to wash your hands, the priest will, before they go into the holy place or the, or the holy of holies once a year, and just that one guy. But, but we're gonna, there's just two pieces of furniture to the tabernacle that you can see outside the tent, outside the holy place and the most holy place, and that's this, this water lava and then, then, and, then, um, and then this burnt offering altar. We're going to talk about that tonight. All three are mentioned, the courtyard, the altar, and, and the lava. So the altar of burnt offering. They built the altar of burnt offering of acacia wood, Three cubits high, so it's almost five feet tall. It's about four and a half feet tall. It was square, five cubits long, five cubits wide, so it's seven and a half feet by seven and a half feet square, and, you know, about as tall as this. They made a horn at each of the four corners. These are according to the instructions that Moses was given by God on the mountain in Exodus 27. So back at Exodus 27, you see God giving him these instructions, and they're repeated here as, as, as they're building it. They made a horn at each of the four corners so that the horns of the altar were of one piece, and they overlaid the altar with bronze. They made all its utensils of bronze, its pots, shovels, sprinkling bowls, meat forks, and fire pans. They made a grating for the altar, a bronze network to be under its ledge, halfway up the altar with air underneath, big hollow area. They cast bronze rings to hold the poles for the four corners of the bronze grating. They made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with bronze, and they inserted the poles into the rings so that they'd be on the sides of the altar for carrying it. They made it hollow out of boards. All right. First, before we go anywhere, uh, let's just play that little video so you can kind of see you're just because we're going to spend so much time on the tabernacle I thought let's just look at the tabernacle so you can get a mental picture of it because when you're just hearing stuff like that it's kind of hard to picture it in your head So there's our burnt offering, our altar, the brazen altar. The water basin or lever, laver. The holy place.
obviously all the curtains that they put on top of it and then the durable leather on top of all of that. Candlestick or menorah, then, then your showbread, your table of the presence. Altar of incense, also with the four horns, but all overlaid with gold. The candlestick made entirely of gold. Cherubim curtains, most holy place, Ark of the Covenant. Staff that budded, the manna jar, the commandments, and then the cherubim looking at the mercy seat where the blood was touched. And then an ad for YouTube. Uh, so this is fascinating. First, it's, it, it's like a big grill. It's like a big hibachi. The, I mean, it's how you can picture it. It's just like a, like a seven foot by seven foot hibachi grill. And they've got the meat forks and they've got the pots and, you know, pots for collecting the blood from the sacrifices and, and draining that out the neck. And they've got, they've got these, uh, you know, generally there's usually a table next to it where they're cutting this stuff up. They'd even tie the, the animals many times to the, to the horns as they're waiting to, you know, put them on and cut them up and put them on. Um, and, and, and you've got, you've got, uh, stuff to drag out the, all of the ashes and take those outside the camp from all the burnt offerings because this thing never stops burning. Their job is just like the menorah, the, you, the candlestick, you got to keep it burning. Matter of fact, you take the fire from that, and this is fascinating, you take the fire from that if you're a priest and you go in with your sensor, your golden sensor, and you light up. The, the candlestick, if that should ever blow out, like that's not supposed to. So you, you keep checking that to make sure that's always going. And that's where the fire comes from, is from this altar. It's really awesome because first, you know, there, there's, the, there's the curtain that you're going to come through if you're an Israelite. If you're an Israelite and not a priest, you stop at the altar. That's as far as you go. The courtyard slash altar, you don't go any further. You don't even get to the water basin. That's for the priest. You don't go any closer. You don't get to get into the holy place or the most holy place. That's only for priests. You stop at the altar. Your connection with God, your ability to interact with the God of all heaven is just inside the curtain of the courtyard and you bring in your sacrifice to that altar, the brazen altar. The seven by seven foot hibachi, that's you. And only the priests and Levites, they get to go further. They get to take care of those things. They get to dismantle it and put it back together and dismantle it and put it back together very carefully. To, you know, poles, don't touch it. Everything, even this, don't touch it. Only the priests can get close enough to touch it. Only the priests are allowed to, you know, smear blood on the horns. Most of the, there's like only five different kind of offerings that they're going to, there's fellowship offerings, sin offerings, burnt offerings. That's the one you don't eat. You burn it all the way. But a lot of these offerings, you actually eat a part of it if you're the Israelite, especially fellowship offerings. You eat quite a bit of that one. And the Levites do. Because all of this meat that you're burning is, so much of it is food for them. And also the grain offerings. The Levites get fed this way. They, they don't have any of their own property in the promised land. They don't get any of that. They're, they're supposed to be taken care of and fed by the people of God's offerings. So that's how this is all looking. That's what's going on. So you're an Israelite. Every single day you start in the morning with a lamb offered on the hibachi. And you finish the day with a lamb on the hibachi. You ever get driving somewhere and someone's baking something like that on a grill? And you just, you know, you're just driving by. I mean, you almost turn in their driveway. It's, it's so wonderful. You almost, it's hard not to do it. It's, it smells so good. Or you get to one of those smokehouse places and it's pouring out the top and it's just in the street and you can smell it. Uh, we would go to certain places. Like, like the, you come out of Home Depot and Longhorns. It's just wafting across the parking lot every time. I can, I can almost not go to both. I just love that smell. They lived in that. They lived in that. They ate quite a bit of meat because they actually were sacrificing all the time. 
there's 2.5 million of them, and everyone that sins has to bring an offering. The thing's always going. It, the fire never goes out. It's always burning. If you're an Israelite camped all around it, what you're seeing is a constant, constant pillar of smoke. Not the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud of the Lord, which is always there. It said that, that's, what, that's how they knew where to go. When that pillar moved, they packed up the temple and they moved. When the pillar stayed in place, they stayed in place. The pillar was always over the tabernacle, it was always there. And when, it, when day or night, if that thing moved, you moved. If that stayed, you stayed, as long as that was there. You stayed near the presence of God. But what these Israelites figured out was two things through this. If you are a child of God, if you're serving the holiest God, the only God, and he has decided to live among you, there are only two ways that you get to be close to him. One, you have got to recognize your own sin. To be in the presence of a holy God, you've got to recognize the fact that there's a constant inferno of sin going up. Every day, they know what that's for. It's for their sin. It's to make them atoned before God so they can stay close to him. Remember that thing he told them? If I go another day, another step with you guys, I might kill you all. And then Moses goes back to me and says, all right, I'm going to go with you. But we're going to set up that tabernacle, and you're going to see a visual representation of your sin every single day and identify with it so that you understand why you've been outside my presence and how to get in it. If you want to be near me, you've got to identify with your sin. When they brought a sin offering, they had to take their hand and put it on the animal's forehead and just stand there with their, animals, with their hand on the animal's forehead while they're saying certain things and then, then kill the animal as a substitute for the person who ought to be on the grill. But the animal goes on it instead. That he just touched, that he brought from home, that's part of his, you know, part of what he owns, it's his livestock, and he brings it and he kills it for his sin, and then instead of him getting laid out on the grill and filleted, that substitute does. And he watches it all happen, burns, and then they eat parts of it. Isn't that wild? And then, all, then the thing burns all up, and they take the ashes, and they take them outside camp. <laughs> if you're an Israelite, so one of the things you see is you, you constantly have this inferno of sin. What does America's look like? Seven feet by seven feet would not be enough for hours. No. It wouldn't be enough. You'd need, you'd need seven miles by seven miles. A constant, I, I would hate to know spiritually what it would look like if we were the Israelites and we had to constantly be keeping this fire burning and bringing our sacrifices for our sins so we could stay close to God. Thank the living God he did something different. But all they are, they're camped all around God's presence, but they can't even get near it. And the, only, the closest they can get is to bring a sin offering and get inside the tent and bring a fellowship offering, a sin offering, a grain offering, a wave offering, a burnt offering, and then, and then meet with a priest right there, only that close, you go no further. But you can see the presence of God, and there's the pillar, and there's everything, and you're pretty close to it. It was their interaction. It was their worship. Their worship was a combination of obedience, move when it moves, do what God says, and also bring the sacrifice. And it was constant. Every single day, morning and night, whether you've done anything wrong or not, there's already going to be a sacrifice. Morning and night is going to be a lamb. Every day. You never don't smell barbecue. It's always going. But then there's all the people bringing whatever they're bringing, whatever God put on their heart to do, they're doing. And they're bringing all of these animals for sacrifice, whatever kind they're doing, or grains. All right, there's the picture. So you've got to identify with your sin to get close to God, and you understand that it's going to take obedience to be close. When he moves, you move. 
that just as they're building this, remember, they're just coming off a horrible disobedience. They're just coming off it. So to look at that smoke rising every day would be a little intimidating for one and embarrassing and like, man, I wish we weren't like this. <laughs> There's that smoke every day reminding us what we did wrong, but also now it's a constant standard of if you want to stay in God's presence, your sin must be atoned for. All right, I just, I, thank God I got my phone. I really need these notes. This time I really need them. Uh, yeah, yeah, I have found it. This was a, a comment that someone, the way they wrote it. Uh, you can't be in God's presence without your sins being burned away. Only by a blood sacrifice could sin be atoned, we know. The brazen altar was ever ablaze and always covered in blood. Always. Every time the Levites killed it, they'd drain out the blood, they'd wipe it on the horns, they'd spill it at the base. There's blood everywhere. You always come, you always see the blood, you always see the death of what is substituted for you, and you always see the smoke rising up to heaven. Your sin. And the only way to be in God's presence is, and the only way to be accepted into his presence was this altar that you first thing you do when you walk into the tabernacle. You walk into church, you're confronted with your own sin, and that burns and floats up for everyone to see. But then this... The brazen altar was ever ablaze, covered in blood, and it always, I love this, always stood open to accept the guilt of any Hebrew person who wished to come near to God. It was always burning because it was always available. It was always burning, and you can look at it from the side of, yeah, I guess it's always got to be burning, the constant sin barbecue. But the reality is, it's always burning because you're always accepted. If you bring your offering of sin, like, I'm, this is all I got, God, and I want to be in your presence, you're accepted. That's amazing. It's always there. The presence of God always there to burn off sin, and then it's taken outside the camp like it didn't exist. The guilty sinner would offer another life, an innocent one, in his stead, and it was always available to him. Everything about that tabernacle we looked at, the whole thing is only Christ. It's pointing you to what Jesus was going to do, what he did, and, and what, he, what he's doing now as a result of what he did. Like the whole thing is an example of it, and we can only get as far as this tonight because of how much is there. So this very first step, of just being identified as a sinner and knowing that if you take it to Christ, he will burn it off. Like John, 1 John 1, 9. He's faithful to forgive all sins. All sins. Is, okay, so it's part two. It's... It's not real pretty. It's not pretty. It, you, know, you saw when you go inside, everything's shiny gold and beautiful and polished and gorgeous. But outside, this thing's a mess. Like, it's, it's got blood all over it. It's not pretty. It's not, it's not this gorgeous piece of furniture in the tabernacle. It's outside, so it's got all of the weatheredness of being outside. And you've got to keep the fire burning so it's just constantly charred. It's bronze fascinating because God is brilliant and he already knows but you can't make this thing out of gold because gold is a tremendous heat conductor and so all it will do is burn and char the wood underneath and it can't last it's acacia wood underneath that's gonna burn highly flammable wood is what they used to make a hibachi with you know so what are you gonna do you gotta preserve that wood so you cover the whole thing and layer it with bronze which has super duper low conductivity of heat and so it maintains for hundreds of years the the wood underneath of it even though the fire never stops 
there is a layer of bronze around the wood that they constructed the altar with that constantly protects what is highly flammable underneath. Meaning, there is a layer between a fiery death that isn't even pretty to look at, but it does preserve the altar that's always open to the sinner. Does that sound like Jesus? Jesus, it said in the Scriptures, there was nothing about him that would cause you to look at him. There was no, no comely thing in his appearance that would be like, oh, wow, he's so attractive. He just had the Spirit of God all over him, so that's what attracted everybody, how he behaved, how he spoke what he did, the miracles he performed. He was God in the flesh. But there was nothing about him, if you were to look at him, that'd be like, oh wow, that guy's different than anybody else. So you get this humdrum looking hibachi. It's the first thing you see, but it is the wall between you and eternal damnation fires. And it can preserve and protect you from that fire in two ways. One, it has low heat conductivity. Two, that's how you don't burn. Something burns in your stead. Jesus is both the altar itself and he's what goes on it. Bronze. Not real pretty, but it gets the job done. Still a precious metal in their time. So some people are like, well, that's a little bit of a stretch. A little bit of a stretch. The whole bronze Jesus thing. Is it? Numbers 21. In Numbers 21, the people start complaining. They don't like their food. Oh, same food every day. So annoying. Just walking through the desert with God. And they start complaining to the point where God says, okay, that's enough. And he sends poisonous snakes, venomous snakes among them to poison the people. And they start getting bit. And people are dying fast. And they blend in with the ground. They can't see them. They're just walking through the desert. And these poisonous vipers are sitting down there. Uh, venomous vipers. You can eat them. <laughs> you just can't get bit by them. They're venomous. And they're dying fast. And then he, and Moses is like, what do we do? And God says, okay, here's how you can solve the problem. Put a bronze snake on a stick. And when anybody gets bit, they look at the bronze snake on the stick and they get healed. And I've shared on this before here. I don't believe you're just like snake. Oh, 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 ding, on better. I think you were feeling the pain, you were feeling the sting, and you kept staring at the bronze snake until that poison was out of your system. Just like we do. Keep spending time in Christ's presence until the poison stops affecting you. That's what you have to do. You can't, you can't just like, it's not a glance. Oh, let me read today's scripture. Good, that's enough for today. You spend time with him to kill the poison. It's a bronze snake. It's bronze. Not real pretty to look at. Why didn't you have him make a gold snake? They got plenty of that stuff from Egypt. Why didn't you have him make a silver snake? Alliteration. It's a bronze snake on a stick. Representative of the bronze low conductivity where he can keep you from the fires of hell. He can. On that that sacrifice on that stick becoming a curse for all of us. Anyone who hangs on a tree is cursed. Becoming a snake. Why would he make Jesus a snake? Because he took all of our sin upon him. So he's this cursed snake on a stick raised above everybody else. Look at that. Keep studying it because that's what's going to take the poison out of you. It's not a stretch. It's bronze for a reason. Then, this constant pillar of smoke has to stay lit at all times. Sacrifices, multiple times a day performed on it. Two guaranteed, one in the morning, one at night, always. Fire on the, on the altar must be kept burning. This is Leviticus 6, 12, and 13. Leviticus 6, 12, and 13. This is God giving instructions again to, to Moses and saying, this is how you do it. The fire on the altar must be kept burning. It must not go out. 
do you think it never rained? Do you think they never had issues? Do you think they never had strong winds? There's all kinds of things that could have stopped this thing from burning. you think they ever uh, had a low amount of wood to work with <laughs> in the <a> desert? <laughs> Probably. But they keep this, no matter what they got to do, rip some people's um, carts apart, something, keep that thing burning. It's got to be kept burning. God's direction was the fire on the altar must be kept burning. It must not go out. Every morning the priest is to add firewood and arrange the burnt offering on the fire and burn the fat of the fellowship offerings on it. They're constantly burning this thing. Every day, fellowship offerings. Every day, fellowship offerings. Did you hear that? Jesus just commanded every day there should be fellowship offerings. This is Hebrews 10, 24, and 26. You should not ever be in the habit of giving up meeting together. Don't do that. The moment you do that, you're dead in the water. Fellowship is crucial to the believer. It is crucial. We must have it. And he's saying this fellowship should be happening every day. So those fellowship offerings, which was their form of drawing close to God in a fellowship way and with the others in the body, that was how they did it. Should be every day. Every morning the priest is to add firewood and arrange the burnt offering on the fire and burn the fat of the fellowship offerings on it every day. The fire must be kept burning on the altar continuously. It must not go out. A visual reminder, again, that our sin must be removed and that it's constantly offered that it can be. And then all the ashes disposed outside of the camp when God says in his word that he would not remember our sins anymore and he would remove them as far from us as the east is from the west. So you burn it up. You think, okay, the ashes probably just stay right there. They don't. They carefully drag them out of there and get them out of the camp. It doesn't belong here anymore. An example of what Christ is doing for us. It doesn't belong here anymore. I remove it, and you don't have to keep being guilty about it. It's not there anymore. Four. My fourth thing in my notes, I don't know why I said four. I'm looking at, I didn't say numbers to you, did I? <laughs> this is my fourth thing. The fact that they would eat many forms of the sacrifices, I didn't realize how many of them they ate. I, I thought they just kind of burned them all up and then took the ashes out. But they eat them all the time. And, and, uh, and more, they eat more of them than they don't. Whenever it's a burnt offering, that's a burnt offering. You burn the whole thing. But they eat a lot of these. And if they don't, the priests do, a portion of them. And there's certain parts of it you're just gonna, you're gonna burn up, but there's certain parts that are meant for eating. So this, so they, so they, they touch it, and they watch it die in their stead, and then they eat some of it. And Jesus says to us, "You've got to eat my body and drink my blood." And then he sets up communion for all time and says, do this in remembrance of me. Break the bread. That's my body broken for you. This wine is my blood of the new covenant. Drink it in remembrance of what I did for you. You have to, if you, if you want to understand the depth of the sacrifice, you have to eat some of it. It, you, it's got to get inside you. It's got to become a part of who you are. Jesus clearly tells them that. It freaks a lot of people out until they understood. This is, this, this is also, I think it's so fascinating. This is how the priests and the Levites were fed. They, they fed on the sacrifices. That's how they lived. That's how they survived. They fed on the sacrifices. We are a kingdom of priests. We have to feed off the sacrifice. We gotta, it's got to be everything to us. That, that, that what Jesus did for us is the epicenter of all time. It must be something that we're feeding off of. 
not just in communion, yes in that, but when he says, eat my body, he said, I am the manna that came from heaven. How do you eat his body? Read his word. Read the word. He said, I am one with my word. I am the manna that came down from heaven that you had to collect early in the morning before it dried up and went away. Do that. Eat the word. Ingest it. Take it in. Let it become a part of who you are or a part of who you are. Eat the sacrifice. No. Yes. He set it up. The question is, was he referring only to the New Testament? He was definitely pointing to what he was going to do. But they had to do this for a long time because this was the law that God set up. But there was a brand new law coming through Christ and everything had to point to it so when you got there, you understood its value. It's just like, it, it, it's so lame uh, to, I, I, I mean, I don't know how many kids have done this. I, I used to go out and try to rip a piece of the corner of the um, wrapping paper of a Christmas present. I'm trying to see what's in it. And I thought if I could just be indiscreet, you know, yeah. hey, what are you doing over there? Oh, I'm just shaking it. You know, but tearing a corner, you just, I got to know what's in there. If you succeed, you just blew everything. Because you might know, but you've ruined the whole surprise. <laughs> it's not, oh, good, I, I know now. Now I've got to wait for another month. Because my, my parents were, were not the kind to you know, put it all there on Christmas morning. They would get it all, wrap it all up, because that was the fun, was to have it be there and then wonder what it is. You got to shake it, touch it, feel the weight of it. But when you, when you did the dumb thing and ripped it open a little bit and looked at it, then you just got to wait anyway, so that was stupid. They had to wait. The value's more. The value goes up when you wait for something. And by, but there had to be something that pointed. The whole tabernacle points to him. And he's in every piece of it. But, but the Israelites, even the Israelites themselves were fed by the sacrifice, but the priests lived off of it. Which made me realize that he was ripped open for us. Amen. We have an altar, by the way. This is Hebrews 13.10. Listen to what it says. This, this, because what you said, James, your question, was that, was that only in New Testament? It is now, but it wasn't then. And, and in Hebrews 13.10, he starts to say, who I think is Paul, but not everybody's sure exactly who wrote Hebrews. It sounds like Paul to me. But he, he starts to say, ceremonial foods that you're eating, they have no value anymore. But then he says this, we have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. Like ceremonial foods was how you got close to God. For, for a thousand years. That's how you did it. You got close to God by bringing your sacrifice and ingesting part of the sacrifice and, and understanding it, putting your hand on it. That's your dying instead of me. That dies as a substitute for you. And that's how you get close to God. You're kind of in it. You can kind of get close to where God is. You can see it. You see the pillar. You see the fire, whatever time you came. And, and it's always burning. But, but I believe Paul, definitely the Holy Spirit, says, now we've got an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle don't even have a right to eat. Because the ones who are still ministering at the tabernacle and still accepting sacrifices at the temple, they've missed the boat. All of that's obsolete. It doesn't matter anymore. So if they're still there doing these age-old sacrifices that are completely unnecessary and accomplish nothing, those ceremonial foods just became zero. They mean squat. Jesus came, the manna came. That's what you're supposed to feed on now. And, and we, as Christians, we have an altar that the priests who minister at the tabernacle have, have no right to eat from because they missed it and they're not willing to join in. 
But what's so sad about that is they're the priests. Up until this point, all the Israelites could only get that far in getting close to God, and the priests got to get closer. Now he's saying, you people that are just coming in, you can go all the way to the most holy place. You can just walk straight through the curtains. Take out the middle man. You don't need a priest anymore. Matter of fact, that priest is not following God's rules if he's still sitting there doing that. Don't bother. It's Jesus now. This thing about touching the, the sacrifice and putting your hand on its head and identifying with the substitution for your life because of your sin. This is from Paul. This is Galatians 2.20. He says, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I've ingested that part. The life I now live in the body I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The, the horns, it's so crazy because Scripture just keeps validating itself, validating itself, validating itself in all these different areas and you, and you, and then you see it and you're like, Wow. Like, I didn't see it there before. But the Word just keeps validating itself. Horns everywhere in the Word, everywhere you find horns in the Word, they're a symbol of strength. That's, that's what they are. You know, it, it's, um, th th there's different things that they can mean, but they're always identified with strength. You find horns on the altar of incense. You find horns at the four corners of... of um, the brazen altar that we're talking about tonight that burns all the sin, sin offerings. And they put blood on, on the horns. This symbol of strength coated with blood where your sins get taken care of. And, this, and they're on every corner, meaning no matter what direction you came from, no matter what direction you came to the altar from, your sins get taken care of. But the way the word hits it from so many angles, I just hadn't seen this before, but when, when, when Abram goes, Abraham goes up the mountain with Isaac and he's got to sacrifice his own son, he's been three days so significant, three days journey, so for all intents and purposes, his son is dead for three days because he knows he's getting there and he's going to kill his son. Sacrifice him. God said, take your one and only son and sacrifice him to me. And so he's going up a mountain, and, and here, here's, here goes his boy carrying the wood. He's carrying his cross to the, top of the, to the top of the mountain, and he's got to kill him there. The father has to kill his one and only son and have his son carry his own method of dying, just the same wood that Jesus carried to Golgotha while his father looked on. The only most amazing part is um, he stops Abraham before the knife and allows him to look and see this this ram stuck in the thorn, uh, in the thicket by its horns. By its horns. So the strongest thing on that animal, its symbol of strength, is, is, uh, is like locked to a tree. The strongest thing the ram has, the strongest thing that this substitute for Abram's son has is its horns and he's locked by him by his own strength he's locked to the tree and and god says kill that instead this is way before the brazen altar this is way before that is that's not a thought in anyone's head right now except for god's everything he does continues to point to what he was going to do with christ everything and so he works with the horns to get it out of the thicket, wrestles it onto the wood, and that dies instead of his only son. The only difference in this whole scenario is that God did not pull back the knife from his own boy. Jesus' strength 
painted with blood, was tied to a tree for our sake. Which I think is just so significantly the same. This one author wrote this as a, as a, as a, as a quick summary, and then I got a scripture in Hebrews to read. But this one author wrote it like this. He said, all the elements of the wilderness tabernacle pointed to God's plan of salvation through Jesus Christ, the coming Messiah. By instituting each ritual of worship, God was teaching his people the fundamental principles of salvation. The brazen altar, where Israel's priests offered substitutionary animal sacrifices for the sins of the people, vividly illustrated the basics of atonement for sin to be in God's presence. The brazen altar was situated prominently in the courtyard of the tabernacle. It was, in fact, the first one encountered upon entering the courtyard. You get in the courtyard, you see this. The picture is clear. We cannot approach the holy presence of the Lord unless we first come to the place of sacrifice where atonement for sin is made. The altar's placement revealed that coming to God or receiving the benefits of his presence requires dealing with the problem of our sin first. Later, Jesus would say, no one comes to the Father except through me. This ancient altar spoke unmistakably of Calvary, underscoring the meaning of Christ's death on the cross, which was the ultimate substitutionary sacrifice for sin. Access to God is ours only when we come to him through the perfect atoning sacrifice of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I don't know. You know where I got this? I thought this was brilliantly written, and I would suggest that you use this tool online. It's called Got Questions. It's fantastic. Every time I've ever asked a question to Got Questions, it's a Christian organization. Whoever they've got working there, they don't, they don't give any credit to anybody. They don't tell you who the people are. They just answer the questions. But they're solid. I just asked. Um, let's see, how did I ask it? I might have asked why the altar was the first thing you see coming in. I'm not sure what I asked. I asked about the brazen altar. I didn't have to get very far, and this is what came up. Wasn't that beautifully written, though? That is phenomenal. It's such a beautiful summary of, of this. All right, so let me read one more. Well, we've got a little bit of time. Hmm. So this is... This is, well, I'll just, I'll probably have to do it like this so I can see it. So Hebrews t um, 10. It, go to Hebrews 10. I, I, I quoted just a little bit of it, but I want to I wanna just, this is just awesome. It says this. The law is only a shadow of the things that are coming not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. This is a big part of the answer to your question, by the way, James, is right here. It's found right here. Otherwise, wouldn't they have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once and for all of their sin, and they would no longer have felt guilty. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you didn't desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you weren't pleased. And then I said, here I am. It's written about me in the scroll. I've come to do your will, my God. First he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, some of the types, you didn't desire, nor were you even pleased with them. 
though they were offered in accordance to your law. Then he said, here I am. I've come to do your will. So he sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we've been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. We've been made holy. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice he's made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Listen to that. For by one sacrifice he has already made perfect forever those who are being made holy. <laughs> it, yeah, it, the tense of that seems out of place. Like, how can this be? How can you have already made me perfect while I'm still in the process of being made holy? How can that be a thing? How can that be past tense? Because at the cross, he said, it's finished. The thing I did, the thing I did in you when you accepted me, it's finished. It's a finished work. I'm going to work with you on this planet. Keep fellowshipping. Keep bringing yourself to my throne, my most holy place, and just communing with me. Eat my word. Eat my body. Drink, uh, uh, drink my blood. Be that. You're being made holy. But I took care of the sin problem right at the get-go. I've already made you perfect. And there's coming a time where I'm going to strip it all off so you'll see that I've done that. Amen. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. This he says, first, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them at that time, says the Lord. After that time, says the Lord, I'll put my laws in their hearts and I'll write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts, I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven... Sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. So he, he, wow. he took he took the place of the seven by seven hibachi. He took the place. It's not needed anymore. And it's and it's always open, the fire's always burning, the blood's always applied. And we're already made perfect, those of us who have accepted Christ. Those of us who haven't can come to that thing from any angle, from any place, from prison, from messed up life, or from what you thought was a good life and then suddenly realized you were a sinner. From any angle. This guy's got all this amount of sin. Well, he can be on the um, northwest side. Well, this guy's lived a pretty good life. No, he hasn't. He's a sinner like everybody else. But he can come on the other side. They can come from any angle, from any background, from anywhere and meet one of those horns of strength and have their sin burned off. I don't have much time, but what I'd love to do, if it's okay. Yeah? <laughs> All right. And I'm not going to be ridiculous. I, I want to go I'm any more ridiculous than, than usual. That last set of songs were so perfect for this, beginning with Amazing Grace, my chains are gone because they've been burned and taken outside the camp. And these all already made us perfect. But also, the holiness of the second part, I'd just love to sing these songs again and sing them with that reality.